Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper. are a cool weather crop and I love a big bowl of turnip greens in the winter time so the chart says it's time to plant them I went out and planted turnips and it was 99 degrees and I just hope when those little fellas stick their heads up through the soil they don't say lady you are some kind of crazy gardener because <laughs> it sure isn't cool weather yet but it's cool here in the studio and we hope that you're comfortable at home I'm Amanda McNulty with Clemson Extension welcoming you to SCETV's gardening show making it grow we're coming to you live from historic downtown Sumter South Carolina and Teresa Lott is in the chat room she would enjoy your company and she's going to tell you when we go inside how easy it is to be one of those chatting people and you can watch the show at the same time we had a grand time moving our way up towards Greenville recently and there we visited our dear friend and fellow Extension agent Corey Tanner while he interviewed someone who's telling us about the wide movement of community gardening in that progressive community. We also are so happy tonight that Dr. John Nelson will be with us as students are back with him at the University of South Carolina. And tonight we have a very special guest. It's always a wonderful night when Gay McLeod comes down from MACV and joins us and tells us about South Carolina, those famous South Carolina peaches. We are the, we are the tastier peach state in South Carolina. And coming up from the low country from Beaufort, Laura Lee Rose, master gardener there and her wonderful friend and fellow and master gardener, um, Sandra Educate have come up to help us answer your questions. So gosh, we've got a lot going on here tonight. Let's go inside and see what we can get going. And Teresa Lott is always getting going. She's just the busiest thing. And Teresa, I got up and looked on Facebook and of course Teresa is a natural resources agent in Florence and she's concerned with water quality. And I looked on Facebook, it's so dry at my house and I saw this contraption that looked like if I had one, I could really water those turnips that I'm trying to get to pop up <laughs> out of the soil. What was all that all about? Well, good evening, Amanda. It was like a present this morning when I opened up Facebook to find that someone had left a photo of a rainwater harvesting system that they had built at their house. And this one is uh, homemade. It consists of three barrels that are linked together. And you can see there's PVC pipe, and that's directing rainwater from the rooftop into the barrels. And then uh, John, who shared the photo, has said that he is using this to uh, fill watering cans and water plants and also to fill up his water features like bird baths. And I know even though there hasn't been much rain uh, lately, I still have water in my rain barrels so I can use that to water all the potted plants on my deck. And rainwater harvesting is a fabulous way to provide a chlorine-free source of water to your plants and also to minimize polluted runoff. So it's good for you, good for your plants, and good for the environment. If you'd like to know how to build your own rain barrel, you can search for Clemson Carolina Clear Rain Barrel Manual. I think just Rain Barrel Manual will get you there. And we have a great uh, manual, as implied by the name, that has at least three different designs that you can build at home yourself and start saving up your rainy days. If you'd like more information, you might consider joining me in the chat room. You can get there by going to the Making It Grow Facebook page, click on the green Let's Talk icon. Remember, it's on the left side of the screen now. Once you click there, you should be directed into the chat room where you click in the yellow box to join in the discussion and then just enter your username and password for either Twitter, Facebook, or Rumble Talk, and we should be chatting soon. Amanda, back to you. 
Thank you, Teresa. And I'm so happy to welcome Sandra Educate. And she does a lot of that down there in Buford. And I think you were in, were you in Laura Lee's first class? I was. And tell me, you said that you live someplace cold and you decided that you thought you could, you could garden 12 months of the year here. I didn't, I didn't find out that I couldn't until I was already here, though. <laughs> the mosquitoes and the humidity and the heat. And yeah. the, everything in Beaufort bites. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, y'all do a wonderful job down there, and I know Laura Lee leans heavily on those master gardeners that you're such a wonderful part of. And we thank you for coming up and being part of our program tonight. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. And of course, Laura Lee Rose is the Clipson Extension agent for horticulture down there in Beaufort. And Laura Lee has all sorts of things going on down there. She has her hands in many things. Um, what have y'all been up to this summer, Laura Lee? Well, it's been pretty hot, as you know, yes, it has. and we've had plenty of rain, so everybody got rain a little bit late, but we did get plenty of it, so we've got plenty of rain in our rain barrels, too. But um, this summer, we're um, uh, just trying to keep everything going. It's time to plant some fall gardens, mm -hmm. and uh, the um, Beaufort Jasper Beekeepers Association is alive and well. We're um, Looking, I got a call today about some swarms. So. Oh, great. Good, good. So there's, the insects have, are still, they don't care if it's hot or not. They just but keep on going, don't keep they? Keep on yeah. going. Those wonderful bees. We're <laughs> glad to hear that you've got healthy bee populations down mm -hmm. there. And we, as we said earlier, we are so tickled pink because Gay McLeod from that famous McLeod farm up in Matby is with us. And Gay, what have you got for us tonight? I hear it's a special treat. Yes, it is. I have a pamphlet that was put together in 1962 from the wives of Chesterfield County peach growers and it's wonderful delightful recipes that they used and got together in 1962. And we're going to make two of them tonight. Well I can't wait and I think we've got a little bit longer to enjoy fabulous South Carolina peaches and we're so happy when Gay has come to share her delightful treasures with us tonight. And Dr. John Nelson who is our favorite professor at the University of South Carolina, is probably sitting at home in Duncan Street with his puppy dogs inside where the mosquitoes won't get them. Dr. John, are you there? Dr. John. Hey, Amanda. Hey. I'm kind of having trouble hearing you, but I know you're there. Well, I am here, Dr. John. And um, can you hear, hear me enough for me to thank you for the wonderful service you do identifying plants for South Carolinians? Well, I'm, we're glad to provide a service in identifying plants, and it's, um, we do it all the time, and we always, we're always getting a bunch of very interesting plants either sent to us in person or um, as uh, email attachments, pictures. Remind, remind us of that email. I think since there's no place to park at the University of South Carolina, um, I think email is the best solution personally. What's your email, Dr. John? Dr. John's email. Right. You can email me just my email address or give me a phone call. Okay. And there you see it, nelson at sc.edu. It couldn't be easier. And the response is very quick. We can't wait to come back to you in a little bit and hear the, about the mystery plant. We've got our first caller. My gracious goodness. That was quick. Shirley up in Union. Thanks for calling, Shirley. How can we help you? Um, when is the best time to plant glad all your books? To plant gladiola bulbs? Yes, ma'am. Well, um, if you still got some in the closet, I think you ought to put them out. But normally, um, that's a spring. And so, when do you think you when do we usually order those and put them out, Laura Lee? Well, usually things that bloom in the summertime, you want to plant in the fall, and things that plant that bloom in the fall, you plant in the spring. So it's kind of confusing. <laughs> isn't it? But we've got all these wonderful catalogs that come, and I think she could certainly find some and make an order probably in the fall, and then get them out um, in the in the early spring for summer. Glad you, are, this, are they tender or do they? Or are they hardy They're all tough. over the state? They're tough. All over the state. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think it's most fun when they um, kind of collapse and get a curl in them instead of being quite so straight. Do you ever, I like those heirloom ones. Have you ever looked, grown into the heirloom gladiolus that are a little bit shorter? The ones that are more perennial? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Byzantium, mm -hmm. I think they mm -hmm. are. Yes. I They're think, delightful. Aren't they charming? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And they do seem to persist longer in South Carolina. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you might want to look into those heirloom, and you say Byzantium is one of the series? Mm-hmm. Okay. I, yes. 
All right, thank you. Barbara's calling us from Pickens, where Millie Davenport does such a wonderful job as the Master Gardener Coordinator and Clemson Extension Agent. And how can we help you since you didn't call Millie on the phone and are calling us instead? Good evening, Amanda and panel. <laughs> um, I have a question. I've, I have used an organic fertilizer called Milorganite. Uh -huh. And I put it around my sweet potatoes, and now I notice that where the Milorganite was dropped, I have mold. Will this harm my sweet potatoes? You have mold? It's molded around where the uh, melorganite was spread, uh -huh. and I was concerned that it will harm my sweet potatoes. And the sweet potatoes are under the soil? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am, they sure yeah. are. Okay, all right. Um, did, did she check the um, melorganite to see that it was listed for vegetable gardening? I know that poconite here in Sumter, which is the same thing, is listed for okay. vegetable gardening. Okay. And for those of you who don't know, this is a byproduct of the sewage sludge, and it has not, it, it is not sewage, it is the bodies of the organisms that do the decomposing, and it's heated up to something mm -hmm. like four or five thousand degrees mm -hmm. um, and it's a very slow release form of fertilizer and I think probably it was just um, there was some it, because it does contain some nitrogen I think probably you had some rain and some moisture mm -hmm. in the soil does that seem like just, a good yeah, scenario? Just break it up and um, you know I probably wouldn't worry about yeah. it. I think that um, you can enjoy some good good sweet potatoes and Richard's calling us now from Hilton Head. Richard we're glad to hear from you and um, do Hello. you Thank you for taking my call. You are um, I have a question about uh, my fig tree. Um, right. When is the best time to prune it, number one? And uh, tell me a little bit about fertilizing as well. Boy, you know, figs are in old yards where nothing happens to them, mm -hmm. and they produce about as well as in other places. Mm -hmm. Do you have a fig? I do. I have several. All right. And how do you care for yours? I, I don't really. <laughs> they, they, Mother Nature is the best gardener for mm -hmm. figs. They really don't require much in the way of if additional it's, fertilizer. If it's outgrown its space, probably the, la the best time to prune it would be late winter. Mm -hmm. And then um, if he has questions about fertilizer, you can always do a soil test. There you go. One thing about figs, if, um, if they are pruned heavily, sometimes they will not set fruit or they'll set fruit but then abort it the next couple of years so it's best to reduce it slowly rather than doing a big pruning at one time mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with mm -hmm. that Laura Lee? Okay and I hope that you'll get lots of figs and enjoy them. Okay Laura Lee um, I know that you are real interested in native plants and bees which are just <laughs> always looking for things to get pollen. I think you brought us some pictures. What have you got for us tonight? Well this is a um, picture of some of the honeybees that were enjoying the goldenrod in our rain garden at the office and I just had such a good time looking at these little bees foraging around you know, bees... Um, so what is this big orange spot on that, that bee? That is actually, he's just packing the pollen, or she is packing the pollen down in some little pouches. Um, bees forage for nectar, mm -hmm. pollen, and water. All right. So always having a water source around and... Um, and a lot of people worry about goldenrod. They think that goldenrod causes achoo, allergy. Achoo, achoo. But um, the, um, the goldenrod is insect pollinated, and the, unfortunately, ragweed and some of the other um, weeds are uh, wind pollinated, and they those are the, are the ones that yeah, cause yeah. the pollen problems. And, so. the, and the goldenrod is so very beautiful right now. And it's our state wildflower. Yeah, and if you have a, y'all have a beekeepers association, I think you help them. Mm -hmm. and, and if people are in your community and want to learn how to learn about bees, can they come and join y'all? They can. Our, we meet the third Tuesday of every month at the at the Oak Tea, the Chelsea Comprehensive Health. Um, center there and okay. uh, we really encourage new beekeepers you don't have to have bees but you might just um, want to come and learn just about come them. and learn okay. and that's what I and call I'm the doing. office if you can't remember the date and time mm -hmm. and they'll tell you well that's wonderful we're going to try now to see if we can get back with Dr. John Nelson and see what kind of he said it was not a plant that we ought to plant in our yard let's see if we can um, if our panel can figure out what it is Dr. John Amanda I was having some trouble with my ear here, Jack, I think it was full of earwax. 
it's, well, it's time for me to wash my hair and take a bath anyway. So well, you know, we're that. supposed to, you know, gosh, you just missed Saturday night, John. That's the thing. <laughs> you should, I'm going, we're going to send you an email on Saturday morning saying, now, John, don't forget, this is the big day. Well, what I have you got? Reminder every yeah. Time. What, what have you got for us in the way of a mystery flat tonight? <clears throat> well, we have a, uh, a very, very beautiful shrub that blooms oh. in the spring uh -huh. and then it, um, produces fruits. They're just oh. really spectacular fruits, gorgeous red fruits. They're sort of shiny red and sort of speckled with silver. Beautiful. And it's just a pretty, pretty thing. And all the critters love to eat them. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> and so do the human beings because this stuff is edible. It's very tasty and people do all sorts of things with them. Or at least they could. These, this stuff is uh, pretty tasty. Um, the problem is, this is a bad plant. This is one of the baddest plants around. And it's one of those Asiatic shrubs that people get all crazy for, and they don't realize that it's an invasive species. So again tonight, we have an invasive shrub. And although it is really pretty, um, especially now in the autumn, uh, <laughs> since its fruits are ripening, uh, it spreads very, very easily because when the birds um, eat up the, the fruits and then they'll squirt the seed out, and then another plant will start up. Oh, mercy. And we'll start up in um, a, a place like the Audubon, the Bidler Forest right there, <laughs> um, you know, where, where we have all these native protected places and mm -hmm. the birds fly over them because it's such a great place for mm -hmm. wildlife and then right. they plant these seeds. Right. Um, yeah. Does this plant have, um, are the leaves particularly attractive or anything about it? Uh, they're they're kind of they're kind of pretty. Now it's related to uh, several other species in the same genus, <clears throat> which also have very attractive leaves. Some mm -hmm. of the leaves are sort of uh, silvery or bronze colored underneath. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. um, and, and and people who like to do flower arrangements think they're all so pretty, and they are. But we have to learn to wean ourselves away from these critters. Mm -hmm. Well, ladies, what's this big bad fella? Well, in the landscaping business, we used to call it ugly Agnes. Ugly <laughs> Agnes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have to try to get rid of one, it takes all day. That yeah. can get so big. Yeah. The the ones that we really hated were the thorny ones, but mm -hmm. this one. Um, is the autumn, yeah, umbilical. An Ely Agnes, an mm -hmm. ugly Agnes is a good <laughs> moniker for this. I never heard that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. oh, we, all, we like to call it that. And unfortunately, you know, John, these are still available mm -hmm. in nurseries and people take them home. And um, we really do need to try to educate people that there are things other than this and things that will also provide food for wildlife and that yeah. will, not become a, will not become a problem. Amanda, I just want to say thanks to Linda Dixon who sent these real pretty pictures along. And I want to say that, you know, school has started. So I've got all of my students out there watching tonight, I hope, for some extra credit. Oh, I hope so too. <laughs> um, students, as someone who was in this class, um, a number of years ago, you need all the extra credit you have, so you just better tune in and pay attention and take notes and read your reading assignment. Um, John, thank you so much. Um, we hope you have a wonderful school year, and I'm so happy that there are still people who are interested in botany. Um, sometimes I despair, but I think it's a wonderful, um, If if even if you don't cons continue with it in an educational way, it opens your eyes to the world around you, and you will certainly create some lovers of nature in your class. Well, I sure hope so. I know you will. Thank you. Teresa, have we got any chatters over there tonight? What's going on? Of course we have chatters. We have 10 speakers and three viewers, so a small crowd, but exciting nonetheless. And we did talk a little bit about rainwater harvesting. Someone mentioned it hasn't rained at her house in three weeks. And uh, sometimes I get that deer in the headlights look when I advocate for rainwater harvesting, that you'll have rain when rain is not plentiful. Uh, but that's because so much water is generated from a rooftop. You get six tenths of a gallon per square foot of roof space in a one inch storm. So if you uh, do the math on a thousand square foot house in a one inch storm, which is pretty common, you'd get 600 gallons of water flowing off that roof, which is more than most homeowners would gather if you're using um, 50 gallon rain barrels. I think I've got about 150 gallon capacity. So you really can save it up and put it to use when uh, mother nature isn't doing the job very well. Amanda, back to you. 
Thank you. And as you said, Teresa, this is a chlorine-free source, and some people feel like you know they, they want to have that opportunity for their plants, that some plants might be sensitive, things like that. So there's just, I don't think you can go wrong with rainwater harvesting. It's a great idea. And we thank Teresa for reminding and, and helping us find the right places to learn about building those rain barrels. Joan is calling us from Townville. Joan, we are happy to talk to you tonight. And how can we help you? Thank you so much. Glad to hear y'all's voice this evening over the phone. I have two questions for you. All right. I'd like to know when I need to plant the seeds for Black Eyed Susan. And also, uh, two of my rose bushes are getting little um, fruit type things like mm -hmm. um, Dr. John was just having on there. And, um, and, and I'm just trying to figure out what those little orange things are. Alrighty. Thank you, Amanda. I'll listen up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, plant the seeds for black-eyed Susans in the spring. It's an annual, mm -hmm. so it would be planted in the spring. Okay. All and right. you would do well to start it inside and then transplant it out after the uh, danger of frost is passed. Okay, thank you. And I, we may not want to have those fruits from the Ely Agnes being passed around, but how about rose hips? Except for the multifloral. Oh, that's true, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. rose hips, yeah. Mm -hmm. good, good source of vitamin C. And mm -hmm. <laughs> um, actually, the rose hips, um, some people make rose hip jam, and of course the mm -hmm. multifloral rose that, rose, that, that Laura Lee is referring to is a terrible invasive, but your garden roses that you're growing do get those beautiful little orange fruits, and they're very high in vitamin C. The English people, who are such um, lovers of roses during the Second World War, used rose hips as their source of vitamin C because they couldn't get any fruit. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's nice to know what we can do and to look at those things in a different way and realize how valuable they can be. Um, Shirley's calling us from Daniel Island. Shirley, how are things down on Daniel Island? Have you been getting some rain or is it dry down there? Um, it's fairly dry. Oh. Well, can we help you with the problem? Oh, yes, Amanda. Um, I have a 15 to 20 foot oak tree in my front yard. It's, mm -hmm. it's about 10 years old. But um, every summer, and this one more so than before, uh, I have these caterpillars um, type worms on them, and they're eating all the foliage off. What can I do about it? Hmm. Um, are they tent caterpillars, or, or, or are they in a web that's that's concentrated in one area? Well, um, there are so many of them that sometimes it looks like a web, but there it's not a web. They're just all there, and they just go along eating all the foliage. Hmm. Goodness gracious. Um, well, well, there are a lot of insects that eat oaks. I mean, that's one of our native um, trees and it's one of the highest um, for species of insects that, that uh, feed on oak trees. I think um, over but, three, 400 different Lepidoptera species feed on oak yeah, trees. Yeah, quite a few, but, um, but if it's eaten all the foliage on the tree, she might want to have um, someone to come out and look at it, call an arborist or have someone see if they can you know, because we don't know, there could be the next thing coming down the road. But. Yeah, that's true. And also, so if you can get some pictures of them and send them, um, I, if you sh can shake it and get some pictures of the caterpillars um, and pe send them to our Facebook page, I think that we could get Vicki Burton Ollie, who's an entomologist, to mm -hmm. look at them. The other thing is, you might be able to use, do you think she could use the imidacloprid? Um, as a systemic, and would that give her some relief since she can't or, spray a tree? that big probably. Mm, I don't know. Spinozid, yeah. maybe some of those products might work, but, um, um, but I would still just want to identify it first to see if it's, if it's a, a native species or an, or an army or worm or something or, like yeah. that. Yeah. So um, take a picture of it and send it to us. Usually oak trees and most trees can withstand a certain amount of feeding. It sounds like for some reason you're having an abnormal amount. So, um, so let's do find out what you've got there, and then we'll try to um, respond to you on Facebook and give you some ideas. Um, thank you. We're always interested in finding about, out about things like that that are happening. Um, Brenda's calling us from Casey, right next to Columbia. Hey, Brenda, how are things over there in Casey? They're wonderful things. Good. <laughs> I have a question. I have um, 
highway grass in my lawn, and I'm wondering how in the world I can get rid of it before it gets a good hold. <laughs> well, if it's there, it's got a hold, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, I believe we have a fact sheet on bahia grass, don't we, Laura Lee? Yeah, and also a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a shovel will get it out by the roots, um, but there are some, there are some other um, uh, herbicides that she can use, but she'll need to um, make sure that she looks at the label to figure out which one. Okay. Um, if you'll go to Clemson HGIC, Brenda, and look up um, Bahia grass, you will find a fact sheet that will give you a lot of information on how to control this. The key is that, I, if I'm not mistaken, you have to make um, multiple, you can't make one application, you have to make the second application or you're wasting your money and wasting pesticide and we don't want to do that. Um, read the label very, very carefully so that you won't do any harm to your grass and there's probably nothing you can do this time of year. I know you can't do anything this time of year. You're going to have to wait until next spring when the weathers are cooler. Um, Laura Lee, we are all proud of fact sheets that we, when people call me with the question, I say, <laughs> oh, hold on, I'm going to look at the fact sheets. And we have um, an association, the South Carolina Association of County Agricultural Agents, and our, we have a media award, and I think somebody who's sitting here with us tonight did some pretty nice media work on a fact sheet. Well, it was a real collaborative effort. Um, Kim Counts and Katie Jackaloni and so many people up at the HGIC helped to put this fact sheet together, but it's on... Um, vegetative buffers and um, the tide, the tidal um, river systems, and uh, what to do if you live on a salt marsh. Plants that um, are useful, and um, yeah, I'm I'm really proud that we got to work together on this and get an award. <laughs> and why do we need to have these buffers there? What's the point of them? Well, the point, um, one of the main things is that the native plants that will emerge um, on the salt marsh are the plants that are supposed to be there that help to filter any pollutants or um, um, even sediment, uh, fresh water, all of those things that can Disrupt um, the disrupt natural cycle mm -hmm, of life. Of mm -hmm. the estuary. And um, so, yeah, so just leaving the buffer is the main thing. And then there are some things. Um, we certainly don't want people cutting down um, grasses along the edge of the marsh, too. So that look that some people want of that moan to the water's edge is very damaging in that it allows pollutants and things to go straight into the water. And Absolutely. I think that, um, that this not, is not only true with our saltwater estuaries, but I think also in our home gardens as well, if I'm not mistaken, if people have retention ponds and all. Mm -hmm. Um, Absolutely. Well, we are proud of you and Kim Counts, and well, this you, is a Kim. wonderful publication, <laughs> and thank you for letting us um, have a chance to say congratulations to, right. for a good job. All right. Well, All right. thank you. Okay. Gloria's calling us from Saluda. Hey, Gloria, and I like to come up to Saluda. You're in a pretty part of the state. How, 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 oh, how can we help you? you? Um, I attended a lecture you did at Orangeburg Calhoun Tech and enjoyed it so much. Well, thank you for being there. I appreciate it. Okay. That was about 10 years ago now. It was You're a long time. Lake Murray. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, have you got something going on that we might be able to help you with? Yes, I have a question about tomato plants. Is there a cut worm that cuts the blossoms off of the tomato plant? Uh, are the, are the, is, it not, is it fruiting and then the blossom falls off? No, it's not fruiting. It just has the blossom and it's look, it looks like it's been cut off. Okay. Um, you know, excess nitrogen can make that happen. Oh, are you still there, Gloria? Um, I, I do not know about a worm, but I do know that um, often this time of year we're putting, um, we're side dressing or putting more nitrogen out. And I once put out too much nitrogen and all the, bloss the, the blossoms fell off and that is a response to too much nitrogen. So if you have been doing that, um, please check and I will try to look and see if I can find out. And if you'll go to the Making It Grow Facebook page, I'll try to put an answer there in the next couple of days. Well, I hope you'll get some Temperature too, when it's so hot, the, the blooms just won't set. They won't set, yeah. Okay. Um, I am, we're sitting here talking about tomatoes and things like that, and that of course is a famous South Carolina crop, but equally important and perhaps um, 
more more versatile in some ways are peaches. And I'm going to go over and visit with my dear friend Gay McLeod. And while I make my way to the side counter, we're going to check in with Teresa and hear about that chat room. Teresa? Thanks, Amanda. We're having a lively discussion as usual. You know, Laura Lee is not the only person who appreciates native plants. It appears that Charles Fox, one of our Making It Grow Facebook fans, appreciates them too as he shared this photo of a native uh, Sorbus Americana, known as the American Mountain Ash. Um, usually a small tree, 15 to 20 feet, although I hear it can grow up to 30 feet if it's uh, particularly happy. Uh, not that much habitat in South Carolina as it would tend to grow in the mountains, but that makes sense since Mr. Fox is in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. It makes beautiful red berries, which are attractive to birds. And um, another thing that will make Laura Lee happy, she mentioned bees. This tree is known to have um, special value for our native bees. So perhaps if you're thinking of adding something to your landscape, consider adding a native. It's almost National Planting Day, which encourages the planting of native species. Now let's check in with Amanda and her guest at the side counter. Thank you, Teresa. We are always happy on making it grow when we get a visit from Gay McLeod. Gay is part of that wonderful McLeod farm up in Macby, South Carolina. How long have y'all been growing peaches up there? Since 1916. 1916. And that's you've right. got a, a document here that's not quite that old, but not tell me what quite. this document is. It was a wonderful pamphlet that was given to me by a relative, and it is uh, has it was it was it's peach recipes from 1962 that peach growers' wives got together. And I'm really excited to show you two today. And they had a lot of a lot of peaches to practice with, so I bet these are going to be pretty they good. Did. Okay. They did. Okay. Well, what are we going to do first? Well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a peach mousse. Mm. And this was out of the recipe book. What you do is you start with two cups of peaches. And I've already sugared them. I put about two-thirds cup of sugar in them. All right. and, and our recipe says to let them sit for oh. about an hour. Let that juice let, develop. Let that, that juice flavor. develop. Mm. And then it says to mash your peaches. Oh. And apparently some of the women mashed them with their hands to get them good uh -huh. and smooshy. Yeah. Yeah. The next thing we do is we put two cups of whipped cream. Oh. Not, not Cool Whip. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, but this is the real cream. thing. This is the real thing. We put two cups and then we stir this up. And then the last thing we do is we add almond extract. Mm. And so. Which really does complement and bring out that does. flavor of the peaches. It reminds you of that little bit of almond flavor they have naturally done. That's it? right. And so we add a, uh, about, about a fourth of a teaspoon. It doesn't take much of almond. It said four drops, but I, nowadays I don't think you can get drops yes. out of there. You have to. <laughs> 1962 things have changed. That's right. Said. Okay. And then this is what it turns out to be. Now, do you put it in the refrigerator or the freezer? The freezer. The freezer. You put it in the freezer and you let it uh, freeze. So I could make this ahead of time and then when we've got a hot day, we could bring this That's out and right. cool off with this delicious peach mousse. That is right. Oh. Gosh, right. I bet that is delicious. Mm. Well, I can't wait for the end of the show when I can put my spoon oh, in there good. and taste it. <laughs> well, I think you've got some other things we as do. well. We do. I have a peach pie recipe that's called a crustless pie. And it is made with brown sugar, <gasps> peaches, brown sugar. flour, mm -hmm. and um, it's just and a little bit of butter. Mm -hmm. um, and it looks, though, Gay, like it has a crust. I think I could probably pass it off and make people think I've been slaving away in the kitchen. <laughs> That's true. It yeah. does. It's a nice recipe. And tell me, the, I think that the brown sugar, I know when I was little, we used to sometimes mix brown sugar with butter and put it on top of hot peach pie. Does that oh, enhance right. the flavor a little differently? I think differently? it does. Mm -hmm. I think the brown sugar is just a different taste than the, using the white sugar that we so, usually do. So actually, it would be kind of a, a way to have a different flavor with the That's peaches. That's right, okay. with the peaches. And crustless and apparently very easy to make. Very easy to make. But you said there's something that's really easy to make. What that's right, got? and it's a, it's, a, it's a favorite recipe of everybody who comes to our market. Uh -huh. It's called a peach enchilada. It just looks wonderful. It's a small peach pie. It mm -hmm. has a uh, peach inside. Mm. Then you pour your sugar, butter, cinnamon on top, and then there's a secret recipe. And what is the secret? The secret is you pour, uh, you, you pour Mountain Dew on top. 
Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew. You do. <laughs> well, there you go, that hillbilly tonic. Mountain That's Dew. right. It and makes it sort of crunchy uh -huh. and delicious. Well, on and top. it's got that kind of lemony lime flavor. It does. Now, it does. you said this one, if I have, um, I, I don't have to make a special pastry, there's something I can no, use. No, you can use crescent rolls. Just the ones that you pop on the open. That's up. right. Gosh. And just put your little a quarter of a peach inside, uh -huh. roll it up. You mean I don't even have to chop the peaches up and do anything Not fancy? really. Come on. Really? <laughs> this is easy. This is easy. In <laughs> fact, this recipe won a peach recipe contest. In fact, it won the state peach recipe wow. contest one year. And they are wonderful. I think that is really, really make. fun. Something that easy to make. That's and it, right. And it's that good. And then you can have the rest of the Mountain Dew when you're hot. Just pour a little bit. That's right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, this has really been fun. And we are going to learn where we can find these recipes when we come back and say goodbye to you at the end of the show. Nice. But I have a feeling that peaches are winding down. Are we they kind of are. at the end of the season? They're winding down. You've got probably a week or so. And, of course, Labor Day weekend is a great time to get some peaches. And, of course, what we want are those wonderful certified South Carolina peaches. And the Department of Agriculture has a website that has South Carolina certified roadside markets. That's and right. And you can, can you call and find out if you they still call. have peaches you available? You can call and find out. Well, I just think... Oh, there's nothing better, and I want to be sure that I end my summer on a high note. And you have started and eat that. Eat some South Carolina peaches. You have started, you have put everybody on the high note by being here with us tonight. Thank you so much for making the visit. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. All righty. And now we're going to check back in with Teresa and those chatters. Teresa? Oh, goodness. Peaches are a summertime favorite, as are watermelons. And Suzette Jordan sent us this photo and wondered why her watermelon has this great big split in it. Watermelons, like some other things you might be trying to grow, tomatoes too, they really like to have consistent moisture levels. And uh, it seems like we've been talking about rain a lot on today's show. Um, Mother Nature hasn't been very kind in keeping that rainfall at a constant level. There's not much you can do to control how much rain you get, but what you can do is make sure you have a nice layer, two to three inches of mulch in your garden, and that will help to retain that soil moisture when the rainfall isn't as plentiful. Plentiful. Hopefully you'll have better success, less splitting of your watermelon and your tomatoes. Now let's check in with Amanda and the panel and see if they can answer some more gardening questions. Well, we sure are going to try and we're going to try to help Richard, who's in West Columbia. Richard, what can we do for you tonight? Good evening, ladies. And to I you too. Okay. I have one, I have one big question. <laughs> uh, when is the best time to transplant crepe myrtles white dogwoods when they're about six feet to eight feet tall, azaleas that are purple and the big leaf and the red small leaf and that nature, and camellia sequoias. Um, well, the best time to transplant would be um, in late winter because what you're going to have to do is root prune. Things that are that large are going to have to be root pruned. and. Uh, and if you're moving and you have to move things immediately, um, you can start root pruning now. You need to look, read about that, call your extension office and they will explain it to you. That will, in But you need to wait until these plants are completely dormant and then you're going to have to do a lot of tender, loving care to take care of them. Um, take care of them and we wish you all the luck in the world in trying to move things that big. Those are kind of big to be moving, Richard, but good luck to you. Um, the community garden movement is one that is really kind of sweeping the country. And I think what it does is it, it really helps people to, gardening is good for you, but actually when you garden with other people, I think the benefits are wonderful because, Sandra, educate, you get to educate people. <laughs> and, um, and they are really doing that in Greenville. We're going to go and visit with Corey Tanner as he visits someone who is really helping people to be successful with community gardens. Today we're here alongside the Swamp Rabbit Trail in a food garden. And with me today is Reese Lyerly, who is the Director of Gardening for Good, and this is Gardening for Good's Teaching Garden. Reese, tell me what is Gardening for Good? Thanks, Corey. So, Gardening for Good is a network and resource center for community gardens in Greenville County. And we support a network of about 80 different gardens um, all across Greenville. They're at churches, schools, neighborhoods, businesses. Um, and what we try to do is provide them with the resources that they need to be successful. Reese, that's great. And what strikes me there is that you said 80 community gardens. Are there really 80 community gardens in Greenville County? 
Yeah, so we've actually been tracking the community gardens here in Greenville since 2011. Um, and we started originally about 35 to 40, and that number's doubled just in the past three years. So people in Greenville seem to be really excited about, about gardening, and, and we hope that Gardening for Good is one of the reasons why they're able to get started. Reese, we're standing in Gardening for Good's teaching garden, and it looks a little different to me than the average backyard garden in South Carolina. So what is a teaching garden, and, and how do you use it? Yeah, Corey, so this is our second growing season here in the teaching garden. And what we found is that as we were trying to teach people in our network about how to grow, um, it's sort of hard to communicate things about irrigation and compost and sustainable practices just using PowerPoint presentations. And so we really want to have a space where we can invite community members into, um, host classes, trainings, volunteer days, um, to teach them about what we um, can grow here in South Carolina. Great, and this is a kind of unusual mix of crops here. I see you have potatoes that are just about ready to dig, and I, I want to look at those in a little while. But also, you have soybeans in your garden. Most of the people think of that as a field crop. Why, why do you have soybeans here? Yeah, so we chose to grow um, the soybeans really just to sort of diversify what we could grow. Um, and also, it's just another fun, easy, um, low-maintenance plant that we could add to our garden. And these, I think, are the vegetable soybeans? Yes, so these are the vegetable ones. Um, we're almost ready. They're filling in the pods, so we're almost ready to start yes. harvesting those. For those sushi lovers out there, they might recognize these as edamame, which I call a upscale boiled peanut. But speaking of peanuts, you also have some peanuts here, and we don't see a lot of those, particularly in the upstate, so those are, that's an interesting crop. Yes, yeah, so this is our second season growing peanuts. Um, it's a really fun crop to talk about, especially with kids. Um, it, it, a lot of people enjoy peanuts, but probably have never seen it grown before. Um, we also like it because after it you know, grows up um, to a good size like it is now, it's sort of self-mulching, not a lot of maintenance, um, and pretty easy to grow. Yep, and who doesn't like good peanuts? Who does not like good peanuts, exactly. I also see some uh, very nice looking butternut squash, one of the great winter squashes that we can grow in South Carolina, and, and sweet potatoes, which are, those are great crops because they store for a long time, right? Yeah, exactly. One of the things we liked about these as well is we, um, during the summers, most often the hardest time to get people out into the garden. It's hot, um, it's sunny a lot, and so we're trying to grow things that are also, you know, grow well during the summer, but thinking about the fall harvest as well. So um, we're standing in beds that used to be our, our garlic beds. We were able to start our butternut squash before we had harvested that and then allow it to take over like you see now. Very neat. And Probably the most unusual thing I see out here is ginger. Is this edible ginger and can we grow it in South Carolina? Yeah, it is edible ginger. And um, I was inspired by some friends last summer that grew a few beds of ginger. So I wanted to try it out myself. Um, really, this is just an experimental bed, something to play around with. Um, we can grow it. Hopefully we won't have an early frost this year. Um, and we should get a, a pretty good crop of, of fresh ginger that we can, can enjoy. I'm really looking forward to that. I hope it, I hope it works out well for you. Me too. Um, and there's also several fruits, uh, different fruit crops in the garden. You have strawberries as kind of a perimeter around your fence, but also I saw some kiwi and raspberries. Yeah, so we have, we have strawberry along our fence line. Um, we have that because the Swamp Rabbit Trail is right next to our garden. Um, so maybe if you're on your bike, grab a strawberry or two. Um, we also wanted to try out hardy kiwi. Um, we have some females behind us and males over to the side. Um, really just as a way to diversify what we're growing and, and teach people about the fruits that can be grown in South Carolina. Yeah, those are really neat plants to grow. Well, obviously a garden of this size takes a fair amount of labor to maintain it and keep it looking this good. I'm sure you don't do all the work by yourself. Not at all, Corey. We have, we have a faithful group of volunteers who come out and work with us. Um, since this is a teaching garden, we want as many people as possible coming out here. Um, we do weekly volunteer days and also these workshops that I was telling you about. Um, and really our goal here is, is that it, like I said, is a, is a platform. So a place where interested gardeners can come, get their hands dirty, you know, figure out what we're doing, learn some of the practices that we have and hopefully be inspired to take it back home. Well, if somebody wanted to volunteer with you, do they need to bring their own tools? No, we, they don't. So we actually have a, a tool shed here on the property that we're really proud of. Um, not just because we have tools that we can use, but we're actually working on a, a tool library. So um, a, a bank of tools that we can rent out to the community gardens that are in Greenville um, that they can use for volunteer days, projects they may have around the garden, things like that. So hopefully relieving some of the, of the burden of providing tools that you need in the garden. Reese, we've really enjoyed our visit out here today, and I would encourage anybody when they're in, in the Greenville area to stop by and visit the teaching garden of Gardening for Good. 
And I know some people want to get in touch with you. They, they may have a community garden and they'd like some help with, or maybe they just want to volunteer in an established community garden. How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, so the best way is to visit our website. It is ggardeningforgood.com. The extra G is for Greenville. And on the website, we have information about starting a community garden, as well as all of our volunteer days for the rest of the year. And also individual garden pages of the community gardens that we have here in Greenville. So if you are local and you want to get involved, that's the best way to find out what we have and say that you're not in Greenville. It's still a good way to see photos of other community gardens and maybe get some ideas for what you can do. Well, Race, I really enjoy getting to work with you from time to time and visiting the teaching garden whenever I get a chance. We really appreciate all that you do for the Greenville area and the community gardening movement. Thanks, Corey. We appreciate you too. What a remarkable organization they have to help people get started, even loaning them tools. And Corey, of course, um, also won an award because he helped put together with collaborators just like you and Kim a wonderful booklet on community gardens. You can call your local extension office and find out how to get that. Um, well, Laura Lee, I know you like native plants. Does this ring a bell? <laughs> <laughs> yes, poke salad, Annie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know that many people think of it as pretty, but I think it's pretty. Oh, gosh, the purple and the green, very pretty. And, um, and I think a lot of times I have purple on my windshield because I think, <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> so, somebody from above is yeah. letting it loose. <laughs> is let loose. Um, a favorite food of, um, of birds. And, and it's really kind of fun to have it in the yard. So, so don't necessarily pull up pokeweed, but let it stay. And, um, and you can feed the birds with it um, without having to put feed in the feeder. Um, Job is calling us from Anderson. We're, Gerald is calling us from Anderson. Excuse me, Gerald. How can we help you tonight? Uh, yes, I was calling about pumpkins. I've got like three pumpkin patches that are within 100 yards of each other. Mm -hmm. And while one of them grows good, the other one seems like they want to have some kind of root rot at the bottom. And you just barely touch them and they fall off right there at the roots. Oh. And then uh, another patch has like brown leaves. Is that too much water or too less water? Um, is, are they all the same variety of pumpkin? Um, there are several different varieties. Oh, okay. Um, well, it could be a fit number of factors because there are pumpkins don't grow particularly well here, and you might have one that grows better in a more northerly area. I think it sounds probably like he might have a problem with root rot. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, there's very little that you can do uh, to remedy that situation. So um, rotation, a new place to plant them. Mm -hmm. Lolly, do you want to add to that? Yeah, or you might want to try some, you know, raising them up on hills or putting them on some mulch, something okay. like that. Okay. But I think choosing the right variety would be a help Absolutely. also. Absolutely. And, um, and you can, certainly can water them too much. They don't need to dry out as Teresa was talking about, even with things like the um, watermelons. You want to keep that soil moisture. So a good a mulch, perhaps, of hay or something like that might help also as well. I hope you get a Halloween pumpkin. We really do. I think that'd be fun. Okay. Lou is calling us from Hopkins. Lou, we're glad to talk to you tonight. And how are things up in Hopkins? Are you hopping around up there? Oh, yes. It's nice up here. It feels almost like a fall day. Oh, I'm so happy for you. That's wonderful. Can we help you with a problem? Yes, ma'am. My question is, I have the uh, a uh, blue hydrangea, mm -hmm. and it's grown pretty big. Good. Last summer it had um, lots of blooms, but this year it didn't bloom at all, and I'm trying to figure out what's the problem. Well, um, you know, we had that cold spell, and I wonder if that could have had something to do with it. Sandra, what do you think? Well, it could be, too, that if it was so big and she pruned it, she might have pruned uh, the new buds off and it, it, if she leaves it alone she should have a good crop next year. But I think that this one is a good size and this y'all may not have been affected but up here Laura Lee um, and Hopkins of course is near mm -hmm. where we are um, unless, a, unless the mop heads were 
extraordinarily well protected, mm -hmm. um, they can be very susceptible to frost damage, can't mm -hmm. they? But they remember they do set their flower buds in the summertime, so we usually tell people not to prune after the 4th of July. Okay. And um, Laura Lee, I think that you have a symposium that's coming up. What I have we do. got going? I do. I'm so excited. We are going to, the South Coast chapter of the South Carolina Native Plant Society is going to be hosting a um, our annual conference at Penn Center. It's going to be Halloween weekend. It's going to be really spooky. We're going to have an oyster <laughs> roast. We're going to have great speakers, um, some wonderful workshops. Penn Center, the museum there, Hunting Island, Fort Fremont. We've just got a lot of things going on. Please visit the website or give me a call. Okay. And um, if you haven't been to the Penn Center on St. Helena Island, it is a beautiful facility that was very important in the history of the Civil Rights Movement and is the home of the Gullah people. It is a beautiful part of our state, and I know you would enjoy going there. No better place to learn about native plants than down there and all the things that go with them, like birds and other things just as beautiful. Um, we have John in Greenville calling us. John, hello. Thank you for calling us. How can we help you? Hi, I have a question about a crepe myrtle tree. All righty. It's, uh, I believe the variety is a kume, I think is how you pronounce it. Okay. It, it's um, supposed to get like 8 to 10 feet tall and white flowers. And according to what I've read, it's supposed to um, bloom twice a year. Okay, I put it in the ground in April of last year, 2013. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, I bought it from a local nursery. It was in a pot, and it had an old bloom on it, so I know it had bloomed in the past. <laughs> um, it hasn't bloomed since. My goodness. Um, you planted it last year? Yes. Okay. Um, Laura Lee? Mm -hmm. um, when the first year that things are planted, they are getting their roots established, so it might just be that it was um, getting its feet uh, in the dirt really well. Um, full sun is really important yes. for blooming, and um, just you know, be patient. Sometimes we uh, we we want to have things right away, but sometimes patience. And you know, although sometimes the crepe myrtles that bloom very, very, very early could have a second flush, that may not happen in Greenville because mm -hmm. that may happen more in places where it's warmer. What but do you think? pruning off the seed heads could will, it, could will help okay, encourage great. that. Okay. Um, we want to thank Gabe McLeod for being with us tonight and for bringing all these wonderful treats and encouraging ways to use the last of the fabulous right. South Carolina peaches. And Gay, if people want to find these recipes, and how can they do that? They can go to our website at maxpride.com or you can visit us on Facebook and we'll have those on our on our pages. Well, and I know that I'm going to go home and find some South Carolina certified peaches and use these recipes. Thank you so very much for making the trip down. I've enjoyed being here. Thank you very much. And now we're going to say good night to Teresa for all the wonderful things that she does with us. Teresa? Thanks, Amanda. It's always fun being here on the set of Making It Grow and interacting with our chatters. Uh, we talked a little bit about planting for the fall. It's hard to imagine that fall is here, but uh, according to the calendar, just a few short weeks away. I have already posted the link to Laura Lee and Kim's wonderful fact sheet about life along the salt marsh, and that's on the Making It Grow Facebook page. Remember that you can post your questions and photos all the time, and we'll do our best to answer those gardening questions. So uh, look forward to uh, living vicariously through your photographs. Amanda? Teresa, have we gone over the ma a magic number recently? A magic number? You or mean a the big number? <laughs> the number, the number of likes on our yeah. page. Uh huh. Oh goodness, we are up to nine thousand forty-eight <laughs> likes, which is incredible. And so, one of the ways that we celebrated was asking for people's nine favorite plants. And uh, I think Amanda and I both agreed that you could ask us today, and we might give you one set. And tomorrow, you know, we might give you nine more. There are so many plants. How can you only have nine favorites? If you'd oh. like to share, feel free to post your nine favorite plants in honor of our nine thousand. likes. Likes. Thank you so much. And of course, Teresa gets great credit because she does such a wonderful job. And Vicki chimes in. We have a lot of help and we thank everybody who participates in our Facebook page. What have you got happening down there as part of your education series? Well, you know, it said that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Uh -huh. And down in Beaufort, we are flattering very sincerely, making it grow with our own version called Keeping It Growing. It's at the Port Royal Farmer's Market, 
It's going to be Saturday, September 13th, and we're having a special treat because the host of Keeping It Growing is Amanda, <laughs> who's I coming to down make, to visit us. Get to make a trip down there. I can't wait to spend time with y'all and all the people who come out. And I think the actual farmer's market will be going on, so we'll have an opportunity to see what wonderful local things are coming in. Indeed. Okay. Um, the Your Day program that comes on Monday through Thursday at noon on all of SCETV radio is a fabulous way to learn about things. And on Monday, September the 1st, Millie Davenport is going to talk about the Small Farm Sustainable Program that she's having online. This is a really cool thing for these people who want to do this kind of work on a small time scale to learn how to do it. And then on Tuesday, Dr. Ann is going to highlight South Carolina foods that have all kinds of health benefits. Isn't that just the coolest thing. I just think that's wonderful. And she always has great ideas. So be sure to always keep your radio tuned to SCETV, particularly at noon. And we also want to thank you for being with us, for being a part of Making It Grow. We enjoy being with you every week. We hope that we help you in some ways. We like to hear from you on Facebook. We love knowing that you're with us and we we'll look forward to seeing you next week. And then it's always fun to say goodbye from here in Sumter with Making It Grow. Making It Grow is brought to you in part by Santee Cooper, South Carolina's state-owned electric and water utility. More information on green power and energy conservation programs online at SanteeCooper.com. The South Carolina Department of Agriculture, reminding you that certified South Carolina agricultural products help make South Carolina grow. Glory Foods, celebrating Southern food with a soulful heritage. Glory Foods, a way of inviting South Carolina back to the dinner table. FTC Diversified, a proud part of your local communities, providing communication, entertainment, and security. Art Fields, a 10-day art competition in Lake City, South Carolina. Additional funding provided by International Paper.